As with any Pokemon game, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet has its fair share of really cool secrets that are hiding within its world, just waiting to be discovered by eagle-eyed players. And in today's video, I have gathered 25 of these really cool secrets that you definitely need to know, cause they're just that cool. So let's go ahead and take a look. So today's video was made possible in part by a very lovely partner, but it's not just any partner. It's actually Detective Pikachu. Well, it's not technically Detective Pikachu. It's the guy who voiced Detective Pikachu, Ryan Reynolds, and his company, Mint Mobile. You've probably seen a few Mint ads with Ryan talking about how you can get premium wireless cell phone coverage with them for as little as $15 a month. That is honestly a steal for a phone bill these days, as many carriers have plans that could have you paying around $100 a month, and Mint doesn't even ask for a fifth of that. What's even better about this though is that the lower price won't cost you coverage, speed, or data, as Mint is built on the largest 5G network in the US, and it's able to offer you such a great price by selling directly to you online, instead of using regular retail stores and all the crazy costs that come along with that. Basically, they save so you can save, and it's also super easy to switch as you can do it right away on your phone from the comfort of your own home, instead of miserably standing in line at a store. And you'll even be able to keep your same phone and phone number. All Mint plans come with unlimited talk and text, free mobile hotspot, and super fast 5G data, and they will even recommend plans to save you money based on how much data you use. And you can even set up a family plan with anyone you want, which could help you save even more. So go to mintmobile.com slash HHH, which is linked in the description, to get premium wireless with Mint Mobile for as little as $15 a month. And a big thank you to Mint for supporting the channel. Starting us off is going to be Arvin, since Arvin is amazing. And one amazing thing about him is that his personal interest in cooking actually carries over into his Pokemon team, as it consists of Greedent, Cloyster, Scovillain, Toadscrool, Garganacle, and his signature Mabostiff. And all of these Pokemon, with the exception of Mabostiff, who is his ace for story purposes, are all actually themed around food. Another character trait of Arvin's is that he's not very good at Pokemon battles, but this isn't just something that is mentioned about him. It also seems to be illustrated in the game as well, as on occasion you can actually see Arvin holding his Pokeballs upside down when you battle him, showing that lack of battling prowess that he is known for. And speaking of Pokemon with themes, one running theme that seems to be apparent in the Paldea Pokedex is dog Pokemon, because there are three different families of them in the Mastiff, Fido, and Grivard evolution lines. This is a lot of dog Pokemon for just one region, but there might be a bigger purpose behind it, as it's possible this trio of dogs are actually meant to be a trio that is based on the classic nursery rhyme, Rub-a-Dub-Dub. The nursery rhyme goes, rub-a-dub-dub, three men in a tub, and mentions that those men are a butcher, a baker, and a candlestick maker. These men, mentioned in the nursery rhyme, correlate perfectly to Paldea's dog Pokemon, as Mastiff can be seen as the butcher with its visibly sharp teeth, Fido is obviously the baker, and Grivard is the candlestick maker with a literal candle on its head. There's even more cool secrets hidden in Paldea's Pokemon designs though, because Bramblin, who is amazing by the way, just wanted to put that out there, also has a secret of its own. Bramblin's cry is actually pretty similar to the iconic whistling tune from the beginning of the main theme from the western movie The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, and is heavily associated with the genre in general, which of course fits Bramblin perfectly as a tumbleweed Pokemon since rolling tumbleweeds are a common trope of western movies. Yet another of these Pokemon design secrets that I really enjoy has to do with Squawkabilly. 
This Pokemon is kind of seen as forgettable by a lot of the fanbase, but its design is actually pretty ingenious. Squawkabilly is based on the Monk Parakeet, and the Monk Parakeet can not only be colored the same green, blue, yellow, and white plumages that Squawkabilly can, but it's also considered to be an invasive species, particularly in Spain where the Paldea region is based on. This invasive trait is integrated into Squawkabilly's design ingeniously by using the infamous rock and roll invasion of the 1950s to illustrate it. This is why Squawkabilly has an Elvis-style pompadour, because Elvis Presley was a figurehead of this invasion as he was helping to popularize the genre at the time. This is also where Squawkabilly's name comes from, as it comes partly from Rockabilly, which was the earliest form of rock and roll music. There are even some interesting things to be discovered at the very beginning of these games as well, as it's implied that the player character is actually from the Gala region. This is implied by the fact that you just recently moved into your house, you have a pet Squavit, and your mom says the word cuppa at the start of the game, which is a classic piece of British slang. She also offers Clavel some tea at the start of the game as well, which is yet another hint at the player being from Galar. An additional piece of evidence that the player is from Galar can be seen in a reference to the Sword and Shield games themselves. If the player spins the control stick in a tight circle while walking around, the player character will attempt to do Leon's famous twirl and victory pose, but unfortunately, they will lose their balance, almost as if it's due to the fact that you're no longer living in Galar anymore. Another interesting fact relating to this one is that it's also implied that the events of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet take place after the events of Sword and Shield, since the book Galar A History can be found in the library at the Academy in Mesa Goza, which is the book that Sonya is actively working on during the events of Sword and Shield's story. Even more Galar connections are present in Scarlet and Violet, though, as it's also mentioned that Penny is originally from Galar as well. It's mentioned while taking on Ortega's Team Star base that the leader of Team Star is originally from the Galar region, and was sent away there before ultimately returning to Paldea. And of course, you eventually learn after this that the leader of Team Star is in fact Penny. Since we just mentioned the Academy though, let's go back and take another look at that, as within these walls is a possible hint at what's to come for Pokemon in the future. In Hassel's art room, it's been noted by many that an interesting piece of artwork can be seen on the wall. The artwork pretty distinctively resembles Ayer's Rock, which is a rock formation in Australia. Given Game Freak's propensity for hinting at their future games ahead of time, it's been speculated that this could possibly be a hint at an Australia region coming in the future, so we'll have to keep a close eye on this one as time goes on to see if it actually pans out in the future. One thing that is noteworthy about Pokemon Scarlet and Violet is that in the various towns and cities of Paldea, almost none of the houses and other buildings are able to be entered into, which is in stark contrast to every other Pokemon game that's come before. However, this may not have always been intended to be the case, because within the data of Scarlet and Violet, an unused interior for a house in Zapapico can be found. It's unknown what this interior might have been planned for, but it's worth noting that there is a tunnel that leads out of the house within this interior, which is pretty peculiar, so it's possible that this house interior might have been a little more important than just an NPC's house, since in the final game, the only interiors the player is able to actually enter into are those that are either important to the story or are the house of an important character. There's even more unused content from Scarlet and Violet that we currently know about as well, including some that was actually shown in the reveal trailer for the games. During the live action portion of the reveal trailer, an interesting symbol can be seen, and at the time, many people wondered what this symbol could be. 
It turns out, though, that it's not quite as significant as some people were thinking it could be, as it's simply just the logo that can be seen on the apron of the gym leader, Katie. And it doesn't have any actual plot significance in the game itself. However, what's interesting is that the logo actually changed from the reveal trailer to the final game, as we can see this same logo in Katie's concept art, but in the final product and in her final art, the logo has been changed and simplified for whatever reason. Gimme Ghoul is a Pokemon that is obviously pretty significant to Paldea, as it was revealed in a special manner prior to the release of Scarlet and Violet, and it evolves into Pokemon number 1000 in Golden Go. However, one thing that's really interesting about this Pokemon that doesn't seem to have an official answer at this time is that in its official artwork, the face of Bronzor can actually be seen being displayed on one of the coin's sides that it is holding. This is obviously very deliberate, but also seems quite random, and it doesn't seem to be currently known what this connection could mean, if anything at all. Another thing that's really interesting about Gimme Ghoul and Golden Go is that it could possibly be the case that they are the reincarnated spirit of the former Paldean Emperor. This is because it is mentioned in Gimme Ghoul's Scarlet Dex entry that it first came into existence about 1500 years ago, which is right around the time that the Paldean Emperor is said to have ruled. This emperor is also said to have been obsessed with treasure, according to Miss Ryfort's history classes, and these Pokemon obviously have a fascination with treasure as well. Gimme Ghoul and Golden Go are also ghost types, which would make sense for this sort of thing, and Gimme Ghoul is usually found in the wild within the various ruins and watchtowers that litter Paldea, which are also implied to be from the era of the Paldean Emperor. Some further lore and environmental storytelling can also be found within the Zero Lab in Area Zero. We know this to be the lab of Professor Sada and Turo, and within the lab, a couple pictures of Arvin and his mastiff can be seen pinned to one of the various whiteboards in the lab. Professor Sada and Turo also have a lab on Poco Path outside of Area Zero, and within this lab, an empty picture frame can be found, implying that the professors took this picture of their son with them from their lab down into Area Zero indicating that despite their rocky relationship with one another, they really do love their son, which, if I do say so myself, is a pretty amazing attention to detail. Another cool attention to detail that can be seen within the Zero Lab also concerns the professors. After you complete the main story of the games, your name will be included in a book in the Academy that registers people who have made it to the Academy's Hall of Fame. Interestingly, Sada and Turo will be listed in the book as well, depending of course on which version of the game you are playing, and while the book does mention that anyone can make it into the Hall of Fame, no matter their field of choice, what appear to be a set of gym badges can be seen being displayed on a shelf in the Zero Lab, indicating that Sada and Turo actually took part in the gym challenge at one point, and completed it, in addition to of course obviously going down the road of a researcher. You obviously battle Sada and Turo within the Zero Lab as well, and once you defeat them, you will then battle either Coridon or Miraidon in a climactic final battle where your Coridon or Miraidon will get to confront the one that bullied them prior to the start of the games. In this battle, the opposing Coridon and Miraidon will always use Taunt as their first move, which is a nice little in-battle reference to the story of the game and how this Coridon and Miraidon has bullied the one that you've been using throughout your adventure. Getting back to some Pokemon facts now, one of the coolest things about this generation's set of starter Pokemon is actually specified in the Pokedex, where it mentions that Quaxly isn't actually native to the Paldea region, saying, this Pokemon migrated to Paldea from distant lands long ago. It makes you wonder what those distant lands are, and if we'll ever get to see them for ourselves.
Tandem Mouse is obviously an interesting Pokemon, as it's actually multiple individual Pokemon in one, and that becomes even more prevalent when it evolves into Mouse Hold and adds either one or two more mice into the mix, depending on the form. The fact that these Pokemon are a family is a central part of their design, but the games are very careful when it comes to letting you know where exactly those babies come from, even going so far as to allow Tandemouse to entirely skip the evolution animation sequence once it is able to evolve. It has to hit level 25 in battle to be able to evolve, but once it does, Mouse Hold will simply appear in your party without playing an evolution animation if it reaches this level without battling via the experience share. Basically, it seems like this is both a cheeky reference to these Pokemon's designs and an attempt at concealing where Mouse Hold's babies actually come from which is both cool and hilarious at the same time, and ends up making Tandem Mouse and Mouse Hold pretty unique. Another interesting Pokemon that might not seem that way on the surface is Lokix. Lokix is notable for being the first bug dark type Pokemon ever, but it's also significant for another reason as well. Lokix is based on the Common Riders of the Common Rider franchise, which is a Japanese TV and media franchise similar to Power Rangers. This is actually pretty significant because Common Rider is actually what inspired the creation of the Pokedex as well when Pokemon was first created. I talk a little more about that in this video right here if you would like to check it out, but this basically gives Lokix an indirect connection to the very origin of Pokemon itself, which is pretty cool. Next, let's move from Pokemon to the Paldea region itself, and in particular, the towns. What's interesting about the towns and cities of Paldea is that all of them are named after various food and kitchen related words, such as Mesa Goza being named after the Spanish word for table, or the town of Los Platos literally meaning the plates in Spanish. Artisan is a noteworthy town in particular for not only being home to the gym leader Brassius, but also being filled with various different works of art. A few of these include works known as the Meditative Seat, the Heterarchical Loop, and the Paradoxical Pauper. And believe it or not, they've actually been seen in a Pokemon game prior to this, as they were first seen as secret base decorations in Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. Another town you'll probably end up in early on in your adventure is Cortondo, and Cortondo has what is probably one of the nicest examples of attention to detail in these games. Within Cortondo are a few pools that can be found next to the various houses and buildings in the city, and if you take a close look at the tile that lines these pools, the pattern of this tile actually uses the same exact pattern as the water tiles within the original in-game map in Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow. Okay, so while we have covered a lot of cool secrets so far, it wouldn't really be a Scarlet and Violet Secrets video if we didn't touch on the Paradox Pokemon. One of these Paradox Pokemon is Iron Bundle, which for all intents and purposes is Paradox Delibird. Iron Bundle is an ice water type, and this typing could potentially have a bit more meaning to it than what can be seen at face value, because it's worth noting that the beta form of Delibird that was recently discovered in the 1997 Space World demo of Pokemon Gold and Silver was also a water and ice type just like Iron Bundle, meaning that it could possibly be the case that this typing is inspired by Delibird's beta design from all those years ago. Another Paradox Pokemon is Brute Bonnet, and its present-day counterpart is Amoongus. Amoongus is the evolved form of Fungus, of course, and something very interesting is mentioned in Fungus's Scarlet Pokedex entry, where it says, There is a theory that the developer of the modern-day Pokeball really liked Fungus, but this has not been confirmed. 
This is essentially implying that Fungus is the inspiration for the look of the modern day Pokeball, which would explain how Fungus and Amoongus have this pattern on their bodies, and how Brute Bonnet could have it as well for that matter, well before the modern Pokeball actually existed. Because it's actually the case that the pattern existed, at least allegedly anyways, before the modern Pokeball. And those were 25 Pokemon Scarlet and Violet secrets you need to know. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to leave a like and let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and be sure to subscribe if you're new for more. With that said though, I'll be back with another new video very soon. Thank you guys so much for watching this one, I really appreciate it. And until then, as always, I will smell you guys later.